Mark, speaking of Mike McDaniel, and I, and I was no by any means trying to insinuate that he also kind of throws shots at other other teams. <laughs> he has not this year, although I do re- I do really respect the way he has. Like he he just knows how to work a room and and he maybe really even does. better than than Kyle Shanahan at this oh, point. He, he's just more built for it. He has such a unique, I don't know, presence and his his sense of humor. It's 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 hard to describe if you haven't you know watched a Mike McDaniel press conference. I suggest getting on YouTube and watching because it is unlike any other NFL head coach. I mean, there were times last year, you know, coordinators for NFL teams, at least for the 49ers, they talk once a week um and mike mcdaniel every once once a week would hop up to the podium for the 49ers and it would just be kind of this off the beaten path you have this guy that's what five foot nine skinny didn't Allegedly. play <laughs> didn't play you know nfl football went to yale he's known as like you know the smart guy for lack of a better term that the nerd on the coaching staff and he just has a, a really unique personality in front of reporters and I think a lot of people, a lot of Niner fans that were aware of it kind of like made fun of it last year because they didn't really know exactly who Mike McDaniel was. But now that he's a head coach and that he's having success in Miami, everyone has kind of embraced it. And, you know, they love the the quirky Mike McDaniel, but it, it certainly comes through. Um, it comes through every time he, he takes the podium. And now you're seeing all these like mic'd up moments on the sideline where he's telling to a tag of Iloa, yeah. George is the much better team than much better than Alabama in the SEC. By far the best team in the SEC. There was another one that from this past week when when their offense was rolling, passing the ball. I think they got up to like a 30 point lead over the Texans in the first half. And he just says to no one in particular as he's walking down the sideline, you know what? I think I'm just going to continue to throw the ball on this drive. Tell me if I'm crazy. It's just like weird quips moments like that for Mike McDaniel that make him stand out because there aren't many other head coaches that that have those kinds of moments. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because honestly, my favorite one was a few weeks ago against the Chicago Bears when he's (laughs) talking to the other team. Like Justin (laughs) Fields is is running up and down on his defense and is, is putting his team in a position to win a football game. And he's looking at Justin Fields who runs at the sideline, going back to the huddle. He says, Hey, stop doing that. <laughs> like stop killing us right now. Yeah. So he, he's, he clearly has uh, not, not only the confidence in himself to, to be okay with saying those things, but a comfortability in the heat of battle, as well yeah. as outside at the podium where he is okay with talking to the opposing quarterback, He's okay, he's okay talking to the opposing media, and he's okay talking to his own team, obviously. Yeah, and there was a moment after that moment uh, in that Bears game where he he told Justin Fields, pleading with him to, like, please stop running all over us. It was a really close Miami win, and I think, you know, the reporters saw that clip floating around Twitter, and they asked Mike McDaniel about it post game. and uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm not getting the quote exactly right, but he said something along the lines of, yeah, I told him to stop because he's killing us. And then he kind of paused for a little bit, maybe chuckled. There were some laughs in the audience. And then he said, yeah, but like he didn't listen to me. Like he just kept going <laughs> or, or something, something along those lines. But yeah, I agree with you. Mike Daniel, he, he's easy to root for. Yeah, he's he's easy to root for. It is. It will be interesting uh, to see how some of these comments and, and approaches to yeah. interaction work if you're not in a winning position i do think that plays into i mean that's the reason why honestly you don't see a lot of head coaches act the way he does one because they're not winning two uh they know how some of these comments get perceived and misconstrued if you then don't continue to win so we'll certainly keep an eye on that but mike mcdaniels is a big part of the dolphin success um maybe a big part of uh what, what happens on sunday obviously but kyle shanahan also he he has his moments, Mark. He has his moments when he he sort of you know goes back and forth with the media, and and we're talking about this before we started recording. But you know, I I go back and forth on Shanahan, and especially with his comments. Sometimes he he seems a bit condescending. Sometimes he seems a bit demeaning, quite frankly, to, to some people. But there's also sometimes when he he is he is enlightening. Like when you get to see the reason why people put him in this pedestal of boy genius or, you know, smarter than thou, like, and, and it happened a little bit this week when he was breaking down the differences between being a coordinator 
and being a head coach. And and I, I'm sorry, I don't have the question in front of me, but but basically he was sort of saying, look, as a coordinator, you, you get to look at things from a prism. You, you look at things from one side of the football, which is I got to score points and I got to get them fast and I got to get them now. We're, you're not even looking at what's, what the defense is even doing. And of course, as a head coach, you can't approach the game like that. So now he's he's maturing and has gone through this over the last five and a half, six years as a head coach to the point where now he's able to reflect back on what he used to do as a coordinator on the offensive side of the ball and what he does now as still the play caller, but as a head coach that has to be responsible for the entirety of the team. I thought it was very interesting. I, I agree. Yeah. The question was, how much does having an elite defense change the way that you look at offensive play calling? And then he went through the whole thing you laid out, how when you're uh, an offensive coordinator, you're solely focused on your offense and you're not even looking at how your defense is performing. But he said, as as you learn to become a head coach, uh, you know, you you have to keep an eye on that. And then he said, you know, for example, I look at sometimes, quote, like that Chargers game earlier uh, when, you know, you have a chance to go, but you also know in the back of your mind, there's no way we're beating us if we get those 40 runs. That's how I feel the way our defense is playing. There comes a time in that New Orleans game last week where you can see your defense. And yeah, we missed a couple there in the red zone where it's like, all right, if they score here, it's 13 to seven. I know exactly what we're doing. We're going out. We get points. We have to win this. We can't give the ball back to them because it's a one possession game. But then the defense holds them again. And you look at the clock and you think about where your team's at and you're like, okay, what's the best way to win this game? And in that moment, when you're up two scores late in the game with your defense balling out like they are, you do not need to, you know, go into that mode where you're like, all right, we got to score here. You just need to kill some clock. And even if you don't waste all of the clock, you're confident that your defense isn't going to give up two scores, uh, you know, to close out the game. So while maybe that's relatively simple and straightforward, I think, Evan, it's relatively rare to to hear Kyle Shanahan kind of give up his his inner inner monologue like that. That's clearly what he's thinking every game and, um, you know, all the time, whether he's a coordinator or a head coach, he's thinking about things like that. But you don't hear him say things like that openly to the media all that often. So I'm not sure it it signals anything. I don't think it's deeper than that. He probably was just, you know, feeling particularly in, in a good mood when, when he said this, I believe it was on Wednesday. Yeah. Wednesday earlier this week, he was able to kind of break down his mindset. And while there will still be Niner fans, I think who are maybe frustrated that the team only put up 13 points. And I mean, he openly admitted to it saying we miss some in the red zone against the saints that we, that we need to be better on. But he also said the way the defense is playing I'm not going to, you know, call plays as if we need a score here because we don't. I'm going to call plays to kill some clock. And the worst case is we don't get a first down. We give the ball back to our defense. And I know our defense isn't going to give up points. Um, and it's something that he didn't do at, at the beginning of his of his head coaching tenure with the 49ers. So I thought it was an interesting kind of look behind the curtain into the mind of Kyle Shanahan and all the decisions that go into every play call and specifically play calls towards the end of games. Yeah. Maybe he was channeling some of his inner Mike McDaniel. Maybe, maybe, or maybe, or maybe that's where Mike McDaniel has actually been able to channel some of his Shanahan, but Kyle's just a little more of a recluse, uh, at least publicly than, than Mike McDaniel. I don't know. Something to keep an eye on. Uh, but, but also, I also wonder too, I, I do think some, and, and, I want to know what you think about this. I do think some fans might hear that as, well, if if on offense, if, if you're you know siloed in on, on one side of the ball and your job is to score points and run it up, and, and he certainly did that as a coordinator, he wouldn't be a head coach if he didn't. Well, then how come now, as the 49ers head coach, your, your goal still isn't to just put up as many points as possible and, and just run up the scoreboard the way that... You know, we we saw maybe in Atlanta or, or I know he was Cleveland, Houston before Washington. Like, how, how come how come Kyle? We're not seeing the the results that that you seem to be promising as an offensive coordinator, but now as a head coach, sometimes you need to you need to know when to to pull on and off the reins. That's that's the natural follow up. I agree. Um, I think the answer probably lies somewhere in the uh, one 
like we already talked about, he in these situations doesn't feel like he has to to win games. And ultimately, it doesn't matter how you win games, just that you win games. So he's not going to take unnecessary risk to, you know, try to score points in a game in which maybe he doesn't need those points. And I think we can all agree, you know, the offense that is trying hard to go out there and score seven points, that is throwing the ball more often, that is taking chances downfield. Again, inherently, that means more risk and more likely to turn over the ball. So I think that's part of it. The other part, which which goes hand in hand with that, is probably uh, trust in your quarterback. And while we've certainly talked a lot this year, specifically in the last month or so, that Jimmy Garoppolo is playing better, and I think we're seeing Kyle Shanahan trust his quarterback more, he, he certainly doesn't trust him as much as, say, he trusted MVP Matt Ryan when he was in Atlanta with Julio Jones and all those other weapons, where they went to the Super Bowl and, and of course, choked that 28-3 to lead. But I think uh, it's <laughs> – exactly. It's a little bit of both there, but I do agree with you that the natural follow-up is, okay, like if you need to focus on all aspects of the team, you know, maybe hire someone else to to be looking after the defense and, and tell you what's going on and and focus solely on the offense so you can get the offense up to where you want it to be. Um, but it, it's probably not as simple as that. I'm sure it isn't. And, and nothing, if we're being honest, ever is with Kyle Shanahan. <laughs> but but one of those factors that plays into that is, like you mentioned, the defense. He has, he has an all-world defense at his disposal. I can't fault him for wanting to use it much in the way maybe he wants to use, uh, you know, a pass heavy offense like he did in Atlanta. Like if that's your strength, that's what you lean on. And a big part of that has been Nick Bosa, who was recently named defensive player of the month for the San Francisco 49ers. And, and right now, Mark, honestly, it like, I, I know we've talked about how Bosa is, is playing, you know, perhaps his, be, his best fo- football and, and should be continuing uh, along those lines. He's got 11 and a half sacks. I think wildly uh his his player prop for the year i think was 11 and a half so if he gets another half sack or more he is going to exceed that total uh probably is going to do it on sunday honestly but to me it's like it's him and micah parsons like those are the only two defenders that i think of when the dpoy conversation comes into in, in into the room like Nick Bosa is playing at such a, a high level of football. And really the fact that he plays on a number one defense, I'm sure some people would argue that he may is the catalyst for that. But then we've also talked about how the 49ers have been so good because of their multi, you know, the, the levels to this of Fred Warner, of guys on the back end of the secondary being quality. Um, that's really the only thing giving me pause or, or kind of like, oh, maybe I got to flip a coin between a Parsons and a Bosa at this point when I'm thinking about defensive player of the year. I think uh, Parsons and Bosa are, are top two. I think there's probably one other that needs to be considered. It's Matthew Judon. Uh, for New England. Uh, Some people been, also like Max Crosby. I know. I, I I mean, Max Crosby has been incredible, but unfortunately with the team he's on, he's, he's not going to get any real chance to win that award. It's, it's just the way that those awards go. Uh, New England probably is kind of teetering on the edge of being good enough to be considered for that sort of thing, unless you know that player just has a record-breaking year. Matthew Judon has been incredible, but but you know not, not record-breaking. Um, I think Parsons probably is is the favorite at this point. Um, but Nick Bosa is right there and I think should be a, a clear number two. Um, and, and we'll see what the rest of the season, you know, has in store. Uh, but I'm, Bosa has been phenomenal. And, you know, there, there's no no surprise that, you know, the the top two pl- uh, players, you know, in, in, you know, odds to win the NFL Defensive Player of the Year lead probably the top two defenses. I mean, that's a gigantic reason why. But when you have a player like that, like Bosa and Parsons, it, you know, so much of the opposing offense is just focused on limiting those guys that it opens up so much else for the rest of the defense. And that's why you have guys like Charles O'Menehu, who who was also on Twitter talking back to, to Raheem Mostert earlier, who's, who's having career seasons. Um, you, you have... Uh, Eric Armstead, who's likely back this week, we'll talk about that in a little bit, who can miss months and the defense still plays phenomenal because that's how good 
Nick Bosa is. And it's similar for Micah Parsons in Dallas. So I agree with you. Nick Bosa right up there. Fantastic that he won November Defensive Player of the Month. Certainly deserving. And uh, we'll see if he has a Defensive Player of the Year in store for us here. He'll need to have a fantastic end of the season because Micah Parsons is as good as anyone else in the league. But, but Bosa is certainly deserving of some kudos as well.